Hey, good afternoon, and thanks for tuning in, folks. I'm going to cover how to prepare to search and find worthwhile companies for sale. And here's a big tip. It's the bottom line. Prepare yourself first or later. Expect to pay more and risk more. I'm Ted Loverett, the original business buyer advocate. For more than 30 years, I've been training and guiding people worldwide who buy small and mid-sized businesses. I'm not a business broker, never have been. I don't sell businesses. I don't represent sellers. You can learn more about how the savviest searchers and buyers are achieving done deals today. And if you really want to dive deep, go to my books, How to Prepare Yourself and Find the Right Business to Buy, or if you have a deal in motion, we're about to get into due diligence, my other book, How to Buy the Right Business the Right Way. You can get them on Amazon. It'll show you what I know. And we're going to now begin highlighting that. Folks, beware the aha moment. If you want to buy or sell a company. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, buyers and sellers, respectively, it's a good idea to expedite learning about what you need to know. I know most people think they know enough. I think by the end of my presentation and the others you've heard in the last couple of days, I'll bet you you found a few things that you didn't know. One of the things to really pay attention to is the reasons why people want to sell a business or purchase one. It's the big why question. Another thing you want to keep in mind right from the get-go, buyers and sellers, is the computation of profit. You know, the adjustments and the other stuff that goes on so that you can hang your hat on well, is this place making any money? And really important, because it's going to affect your search and your offering, how about the multiples that people are using to arrive at asking prices and the offering prices? Keep this goal in mind. We want to move forward with an LOI, letter of intent, or let's say you're in England, uh, or maybe Australia, heads of terms. Okay, look, here's the deal. Time and generalized conversations are like the saying, familiarity breeds contempt. And it's, it's not so much that, that people begin to dislike each other, although that sometimes happens, but it's scary to sell and buy businesses. And the more time buyers let sellers think about it, the more likely the seller's fears will increase. And that may cause, well, the owners, the sellers, the business brokers to have their aha moment. And what is that aha moment? <laughs> that aha moment is, hey, maybe we ought to get some buyer competition. We on the buy side, uh, we don't like that. So sellers, but don't forget, competition goes both ways. <laughs> well, well, you're delaying us, guess what? We're looking at other deals. And that's what today is all about, trying to prepare so we have more opportunities than we can handle. Look, searches and buyers, unless they're really stupid, won't sit on the sidelines. Just, it's just stupid. So don't do it. Savvy searchers always have pending at least two worthwhile deals. If you're not doing that, you are going backwards and your competition is getting in front of you. And it's no fun if you're trying to buy a business one step at a time, let's say serially, to put days, weeks, months, or years into a transaction that falls apart, then you get to start all over. So when we're searching, we are searching concurrently all the way until the day of closing. And I mean the day of closing, why? Because those of us who have been around have seen deals crater at escrow. So if you don't have any other deals in your pipeline, guess what, you get to start over. You know, I know, let's, <laughs> this reminds me of a story. Two, two guys are, are walking through the jungle when a lion appears on the path. One of the, the two guys starts putting on a pair of running shoes. Well, why bother with running shoes, says the first guy. There, there's no way you, you can outrun a lion. Well, who said anything up about outrunning a lion, says the second guy. I just want to outrun you. <laughs> you know, that story is what searchers and sellers are up against. It's the competition. 
that they're both facing. Okay, so what are you up against? Well, first of all, expect a lot of surprises. They're going to, well, they should, change your perception as you're going along, and, and, can, and, and they can even increase your opportunity. You know, one of the notes I'm looking at that I made to myself is people wanting to buy businesses, they're facing what appear to be insurmountable obstacles. And you see this if you're following people searching for businesses to buy. There's a whole lot of whining out there, complaining, disappointment. Hey, that's normal, so get over it. What are some of them? Well, I'll give you four or five big ones. Ignorance, the ignorance of searchers, the ignorance of sellers, hey, the ignorance of business brokers, the ignorance of, uh, well, advisors. These are all people who are making it more difficult for buyers and sellers to, what, have a meeting of the mind. The other one is buyer competition. That's just huge. I'm going to say that probably eight times during this presentation. If you write anything down, write this down. Learn to avoid or best buyer competition if you want to buy the right business the right way. You know, the other insurmountable obstacles that we have to go through or go around are, well, business brokers. <laughs> Later, we'll talk about that one. And the other problem we all face is illegitimate seminars and experts. Look, I'm the guy who decades ago dreamt up this whole niche called business buyer consulting, and I've trained 298 lawyers, accountants, bankers, and other kinds of consultants who what? Help buyers go through the thicket to get a done deal. These illegitimate bozos out there, they're reading my books, they're reading other books by other people who know what the hell they're doing. They come to programs like this, they pick up some sound bites and they spit them out on social networking. Don't fall for that crap. You can go to my uh, YouTube channel and you'll see a sizzling interview I did with somebody where we, we kind of stripped some of these illegitimate people. But that's a big obstacle, and, but it is insurmountable if you just ignore them. And, and the final one are just the poorly prepared and the unrealistic sellers. Now, sellers, don't get mad at me yet because I'm going to show you a whole lot of stuff you can use to screen buyers and get done deals. Okay, let's just see. I think I can switch the slide. Okay, I did it. Take a look. Okay, let's begin to consider how to prepare to search and find worthwhile opportunities. And let's begin with reality. Most searchers give up trying to buy a business. I'm pausing. Think about that. They can't buy a business because they can't find worthwhile opportunities. And that's why the savviest buyers before searching learn how to prepare themselves to find the right businesses and to learn how to buy them the right ways. But what I see out on the playing field are the do-it-yourselfers messing around with brokers and owners, making fools of themselves, getting blackballed by entire sectors. And it's kind of hard to get people to look at the new you when you come back a month or two later as the newly improved and educated. Just don't fall. Don't do that. Because that is an insurmountable obstacle. Here's some more reality. Poorly prepared people who cannot show their advisors. I know you guys say, and women, oh, I don't need an advisor. I, you know, I'm getting all this stuff free on the internet. Okay. Poorly prepared people who cannot show their advisors worthwhile deals. That's the number one reason why attorneys, accountants, lenders, and others kill deals or have trouble with clients. Hey, guess what? Business brokers too, they suffer from ill prepared buyers. So, hey, you don't believe me? Why don't you just ask them? So the point on this slide is just look at best businesses for sale only searchers. Ignore the junk. Oh, by the way, chat, go ahead and put questions in chat. Um, I, I don't, I do not intend to use all my time lecturing. So there'll be time for chat, but I'm not going to wait at the end. If it doesn't have questions, I'm out of here. It's Friday night. It's a holiday weekend in the USA. So fill that chat box. I'm going to go through 10 PowerPoint slides. I'm going to move along kind of quickly, but I'll slow it down once in a while for you to catch up. I know people are tired, end of the day. What I'm going to cover in, in, in my presentation are the kinds of things everybody needs to know. And yes, I'm going to repeat myself a couple of times. Why? Because, as you know, if you've ever taught anybody anything, retention goes bye-bye in about two seconds. 
So bear with me if I repeat, I'm doing it purposely. You need it. And anyway, you know what they say? We teach what we need to learn. And this helps me stay on track too. Okay. Oh, by the way, if I don't say something that you need to know, I'll tell you what you need to know. One week, you get one week. Within one week after this event, that's February 17th. That's today. One, one, one week from now, if you email me from my website, any question relating to preparing and searching, I will privately answer it. Got it? So put your stuff in um, the chat. But if I can't get to it or I don't do a good enough job, I can't lecture, you know, to, I can't answer a, a complicated question in four or five words, which pretty much happens in, when you're in these chat things, okay? Go to my website, partneroncall.com, email me. Now, by the way, if you have Gmail, which you should not, you know, only the most naive people use Gmail if they're trying to buy a business. It makes you look cheap, makes you look incompetent, makes you look like you're not really in business, but there's something worse. A lot of Gmail that gets sent to brokers, owners, me, never get seen because our chat filter, not chat, our spam filters kill it. So if you're talking business opportunity, go get your own domain, own domain like uh, you know, Ted Leverett at IWantToBuyABusiness.com. Got it? If you're using Gmail, at the minimum, when you email me, you better whitelist me or make me a contact, or you probably will not get my reply, and I'm not going to chase you. Okay, that's a lot of talk right there. But guess what? This is one of the biggest obstacles that searchers are facing, and they don't even know it. I had a broker tell me about, I don't know, two or three weeks ago on LinkedIn, how many searchers and buyers and some sellers or wannabe sellers call him complaining they're mad. Well, why don't you answer my email? Well, these people are, <laughs> they're using Gmail and, and Hotmail and all the other crap. Just don't do it. Okay, look, here's a good news and bad news story. A few days after buying a business, the new owner went to a fortune teller who looked into a crystal ball and said, owning your business will be a living nightmare for the next three years. And then what will happen, asked the buyer, hopefully. Well, then you'll get used to it. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, you, you know, the, e the easiest and the best way to avoid buying a loser is to get access to lots of winners, especially while avoiding buyer competition. I'll say it again. Best business for sale only. Okay, more reality. Business mistakes that buyers make are errors of omission, not knowing what to do. And you know what? Even people who know what to do sometimes do the wrong thing, especially if they have a bad case of business buyer fever. That's wanting a particular business so badly they suspend their common sense. You know, it takes two things to succeed, information and experience. So wannabe buyers can gaze into a crystal ball with wishful thinking, or they can learn what they need to know before showing what they don't know on the playing field. Okay, folks. Lots of books on buying a business. Probably you've read some of them. I hope you read at least my How to Buy the Right Business the Right Way book. Um, but there's only one book that's written for search. Why? Why did I write that book? Because you can't buy the right business if you what? Cannot find it. Whoops, I hit the wrong button. One of the things you saw in the advertising for this is I'm doing a giveaway. My finance book right here. How did, look at this title. How to get all the money you want for your business without stealing it. That book came out in 1997, the first time. Over 50,000 of those are out there in circulation. 50,000, that's a lot. It, I don't sell that one on Amazon. I sell that for my uh, I sell that on my website for $19.95. Don't get too nervous yet. You're getting it free. There are 500 tactics in there. And this is not, you know, bullshit. How to uh, write a business plan or submit an application. None of that nonsense. You get that from, you know, the 
the uh, we'll call it academic books on the topic. Here you get 500 tactics. These are things that actually work. So guess what? If you want to buy or sell a business, you better be damn savvy on creative financing because that's what's going to hold a deal together. Oh, well, unless you have a buyer who can just write check and pay cash. All right. How do you get this book? Well, you go to my website, partneroncall.com. You find that book and you type in this, B-O-S-S-U-P, Boss Up, all capital letters. Don't email me and tell me what, that you need it. I'm telling you now, B-O-S-S-U-P. This offer expires February 25th. So if you don't do it before February 25th, don't email me, don't direct mail me, don't do anything to me. Do it today or over the weekend. Anyway, within a week. Got it? That's going to help you get deals done. We've So many brokers have told me over the years that they closed deals because they got into that book and found that one out of 500 technique that got them over the hump. And those of you who are looking at SBA or other kinds of financing, you know there are ways you can cook your financing. Well, here's 500. All right. Enough of that. <sighs> Okay, look, here's my recommendation to business sellers. Hey, sellers, remember I told you stick around? Let's look a little bit at the wishful thinking posers. <laughs> you know, these are the, the pretending searchers and the self-proclaimed buyers. Social networking is full of these people. It's vital that business sellers detect phony buyers. So we buyers, we want to detect the phony advisors and experts who are trying to tell us what to do. But you sellers, you got to avoid these people who say they're buyers when they're not. We're the people who say they're a private equity group. And of course, they've never done a deal and they just have a website that makes it look like that. You got to dump those people instantly. Why? Because these bloviating people are pretending to be more than what, that they are and to have more than they can offer sellers. Here's what searchers can do to be more credible, and it's how sellers judge buyers. Listen up, sellers. Salt. I'm, you know, I make up these. Um, uh, what do you call it? Acronyms. S A L T. The S. Show yourself truthfully. Hey, what's wrong with that? Well, I can tell you a lot of searchers don't. Remember, now we're talking about searchers. We already know about sellers. A. Authentically. Be authentic. That's how you get responses, searchers, from sellers, brokers, and investors. Remember, they are being flooded with all these nitwit pretending searchers. So if, if you show yourself truthfully, let them see who you are as a person, be authentic. Oh, it's a breath of fresh air. But the L, listen first and then hear more. What I hear, even from my own clients, the buyers, is they yak, 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 yak. And it's like, why are you doing that? and talk less. That's what the T is for. When you're talking to owners, get them doing the talking. You do the question. You're asking questions. Hey, don't try to fool sellers and brokers. Okay, now, sellers and brokers, here's my advice. Confidentially, now this is top secret, okay? Let's not pass this around too much. Confidentially, behind the scenes, spread the word in your industry whenever charlatans show up and they're posing as legitimate buyers. Let the word out. Let's get them blackballed. Now, the good news for searchers is most of the people, you're going to love this one, searchers. The good news for searchers is most of the people looking to buy a business don't have a clue about how to do it. And that's why you've heard, I don't know, 75, 85% of the searchers never make offers. Well, they might make offers, but, but they don't complete deals. So if you're back to sellers, if, if you're thinking of selling a business, just don't bother with these self-proclaimed buyers. If they don't, if they don't show up showing what I'm teaching today, stick around, seller. If the buyers don't show up in the first moments doing what I'm telling you, get them out of there. Why? Because it's your confidentiality at risk. And guess what? They're going to make you crazy. Well. Somebody said to me, could you just say this in a few sentences? Okay, I will. This is for searchers. Um, what does it say on that? Yeah, everything you need to know to buy the right business the right way, comma, sooner. Here we go. Buying a business is all about search because if you can't find it, you can't buy it. And it's about being best and first. First on scene with sellers. 
and being the seller's first choice and top of mind for brokers and sellers. And most importantly, avoiding buyer competition. There you go, eight sentences. Now, what about having to compete with other buyers? Well, guess what? You have to outbid them. Basically, you have to outbid the most ignorant buyer because they're the ones who are going to offer what the dumbest terms that you have to get dumber on if you want to buy a particular business. This is why we're going to later talk a little bit about how you avoid this competition. Okay, so look, how, one of the ways you, you can avoid this buyer competition is to what? Go to the hidden market or some people call it off-market opportunity. These are the businesses that are not for sale, the ones that could be if you properly, if you search or properly approach the owners. And boy, if you don't properly approach them, there's a good way to get blackballed by an entire industry because you don't want Mary Lou, the receptionist, working for the company you want to buy to spread the word that the company is for sale when in fact it's not and the owner hasn't even thought about it, but you made some naive approach where she tells everybody. And guess what? She might not even pass you on to the owner. So you got to make that approach correctly. Now, look, if you cannot avoid competition, well, beat them. Or as I say, best them. And how do you do that? Okay, it's not a rhetorical question. You do it with a winning business buyer marketing plan. That's what I help my clients do. I don't work for anybody unless we do this first, because if we don't do this first, all the other stuff I could teach you in my books about finding deals, doing deals, it, it may not work because we got to be able to get to first base and that's being credible and first choice. Okay. Well, there's reality, folks. Too many people buy the wrong business or they buy the right business the wrong way. We're going to do a lot of recognition of reality. Here's another one. Beginning with what buyers are up against and how they can be taken seriously. Focus your search on mature, profitable, fairly priced businesses having sustainable competitive advantage. That's the key. Hey, look, at if you love business buyer competition and you're a business seller, hooray for you. Hey, let's celebrate. But if you're the buyer, you absolutely have to beat or get around that competition. So here's some more reality. Guess what, folks? Your fun and your risk begins during your preliminary, that means the first moments, interactions with the other side of your deal-making tables. It's called what? Preliminary due diligence. Some people call it pre-LOI due diligence. I did a whole set of, um, what do you call it, videos on my YouTube channel. Just say Ted Leverett at YouTube, you'll find them where buyers and sellers need to know right up front in that first moment whether it's smart for them to exchange information or to abort one another. This stuff happens in the first communication. Hey, look, a lot of sellers will play with you even if you're an idiot, if you're a searcher. They'll do it. Why? Because they're going to school on you. They're practicing. They know they're not going to do a deal with you. So, you know, they'll see your boilerplate LOI you downloaded somewhere. Maybe they'll get you to do a Q of E, you know, quality of earnings reports, spend 10,000 bucks or 2,000 bucks for that, blah, blah, blah. You basically are giving them free management consulting. While we're talking about money, never forget your lost income opportunity. Irrationally, irrationally, deferring an M&A transaction presents at least two kinds of potential losses. And both of these risks are avoidable. One, missing out on the best opportunity that you're going to get, either the best seller or the best buyer, right in front of you. Mess it up in that first couple of interactions, game over, start again. But here's the second one that causes lost income opportunity. That's what you would have earned every month longer it takes you to complete your deal. So the buyers I work for, most of them are already want to make, I don't know, 50,000, 100,000, several hundred thousand a month. If <laughs> Let's just say it's um, about, just because it's a round number, 100,000 a month. Well, if they, if they, if they are, um, what, just messing around out there, 
a week is 25,000 bucks. A day is 5,000 bucks. An hour is what? A lot. <laughs> now, that hidden market I mentioned, that's where up to 80% of the mature, profitable, and fairly priced small and mid sized companies are quietly for sale by owner. Few of those owners are advertising their business for sale. That's why when you go to the online venues, you don't see too many of them, if any. And particularly in the niches you may be looking for. Now, some of these winners are not yet on the market, but they and other sellers, they want to safely meet qualified buyers. They qualify you in the first conversation. Okay, I said it now three times. Few of these owners will admit they're for sale to buyers they don't know. So how are you going to get them to talk to you if they don't want to admit it because they're not sure you'll let the word out? Well, what's one of the things we'll, we'll hint at today, but we do a deep dive on that in my um, preparing how to find your, uh, how to prepare yourself and what find businesses for sale. You got to handle that right. And then, and then they will say, well, OK, look, I'm not for sale, but George, I'll, I'll talk to you about it and let you see what you have to say. The nice thing about the hidden market, the off market, the businesses that are not yet for sale is you save time and you avoid buyer competition. Because guess what? These, these businesses are not being marketed, especially to the what general public. This is pretty nice stuff if you get there. Now, oh, wait a second. I know business brokers. I think some of them are tuned in. You know what I always say. All my clients begin with business brokers. If we can get the low-hanging fruit that's a wonderful business that you listed last week, and we can work a deal and you help us get it done quickly because what, you want that commission? Hey, we go with you. But we're not going to wait for you to go out and find what we want. That's why we go direct to owners. All right. So what is this uh, winning searcher marketing plan to find business acquisitions? Hmm. Well, it has to do with you answering this question. How well are you selling yourself to owners and sellers of companies? And how well are you besting your buyer competition? And how well are you, and this is really important, wowing potential lenders or investors? Doesn't do any good out there to find businesses for sale, <laughs> particularly if you need money. And you don't know how to wow the lender or wow the investors. This is why I see so many people out there claiming they have investors. They don't have investors. They just have friends, relatives, and a whole lot of college buddies who say, yeah, go find something great. Talk to me. Go waste the seller's time on due diligence. And guess what? I'll come in and do it again. And pretty soon, um, you know, it's just spinning, spinning, spinning. Time is money. So what are the elements? Well, the first thing is what you say first. I remember now I'm talking to searchers. It's the first thing you say first to brokers, owners, and sellers because you don't get a second chance to make the right first impression. We use, but well, we rehearse, we use Zoom and we go through about 30 or 40 questions. And the whole idea is, Practice those so when the owners and sellers ask the questions, we know they're going to ask. And there's no boilerplate list, particularly. I do have some listed in my books, but we have to we have to kind of tailor that to the kind of business you're looking for and the size and location. Then we practice it till we could get a, a, an Academy Award because that's what the other searchers don't do. They just wing it. They make it up. They have conversations. Okay, pitch decks. Um, unless you're buying a business that's competing with looking for private equity stuff, it's not a good idea to use it. So I'm sorry to rain on your parade if you got that real fancy pitch deck. Acquisition criteria, it goes wrong there. If you don't find a business you're going to qualify to buy, you waste a whole lot of time. What about the methodology? Here we're talking about the timing and the targeting and how you follow up with owners and brokers. What about search tools? That's prospecting, you know, letters, emails, phones, et cetera. You got to have that right. It's got to be scripted right. If it doesn't sell, you don't buy. Resume, two things go wrong. First thing, resume is me, 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 me. Nobody gives a shit about you. They want to know what you're going to give them. So you got to show the bridge from where you are, what you want to do to something else, particularly if you're buying a business outside your direct experience. Hey, your lender is going to demand that. You can't show how you go from where you are to there. Game over. And finally, online presence. Everybody Googles. Google, Google, Google. Even if it doesn't pertain to your search, they're Googling you. You better look good. You better get rid of all that junk that's out there. Otherwise, what? 
I don't need to say it. And what about these things called indications of interest? Well, yeah, it's, you do it verbally. Hey, I'm really interested in your business. <laughs> or you might do it written after an interview. Yeah, I'm really interested in your business. Here's where things go to, to uh, hell in a handbasket. NDAs. If you're a searcher, you better have an NDA that is a mutual NDA. Why? Do you want the world to see your financial statement? Do you want sellers to tell their buddies in the industry how you treated them? Hmm. If you're employed, do you want to get fired because the word gets out? Now, what about letters of intent? Well, be careful to committing to a fixed multiple to price the company for sale. Don't lowball. Listen to this tape again if you need to hear that again. And finally, of course, if you don't measure it, you're not going to do it. You're not going to know what in the hell you're doing. So you got to measure your response rate in what? The worthiness of responses. Now, remember, buyers, what you show or fir what you show or voice, voice first to brokers, owners, sellers, it's going to either repel them or motivate them to talk to you. There's five other searchers right out the door wanting to talk to these owners and brokers. And sellers, the same goes for you. Don't show us these poorly written or misleading, what, SIMs, you know, confidential information memorandums or whatever the hell you call them. Okay, moving right along. Hey, how about this one? Buyer competition, you better write this down. Buyer competition is responsible for more bad deals than seller misrepresentation or lousy businesses. Competition forces most searchers to unsafely expedite the process of evaluating and negotiating the purchase of companies. Few searchers know how to adequately value small and mid-sized businesses. Most searchers don't hire or properly deploy a competent advisory team. First impressions matter. I think I've now said that five times. Brokers and sellers, hey, because of their confidentiality and the operational and other reasons, are simply not interested in interacting with searchers who what? Don't upfront convincingly showcase their value. And those are the reasons why the poorly advised and the poorly prepared buyers <laughs> outbid their most ignorant buyer, comp <laughs> their buyer competition. Hey, what? What about selling a business in the seller's market? I know the brokers out there are still saying it's a seller's market. Well, it can be, particularly in some sectors. So who's selling, who's selling whom? Sellers and brokers have to be sold on you if you want a chance to evaluate opportunities, maybe to make offers. It's all about selling, isn't it? Another question you better be thinking about, because again, the brokers are telling people values are increasing. Well, is it the values that are increasing or is merely the pricing? <laughs> uh, yeah, there are a whole lot of businesses out there that got pregnant with profit during COVID and thereafter. And if you're looking at the comps in the databases from a year ago, oh, you're using these various multiples. Well, guess what? They're all overpriced. All of them. All of them. And don't forget what interest rate cost the capital. If interest rates doubled and you're paying multiples from a year ago, well, that's about as naive as you get. Do not catch buyer fever. Buyer fever is raging now. Look at all these layoffs. Where do you think some of these people are going that have been making money? Looking, well, they're out competing with us. Ignorant buyers are making bad deals. And I say, you may think you're winning, but you're really losing if it's the bad deal. Now, how do you know when it's a seller's market? I'm going to give you, what, let's say five or six things to think about. It's a seller's market if you believe it when people say so. It's a seller's market uh, if this, this, the seller is attracting buyer competition. Hey, they'll tell you. They'll say, move this right along. You're, you're number three in the line. Uh, it's a seller's market if you're in a bidding war or the seller's better at you at presenting and deal making, or, or the seller's advisory team is better than yours. And it almost always is, unless you're my client or you're working with people like me who force you to get the right lawyer and accountant and get them in up front and don't keep falling for these other people who say they can do work for you that you should be doing yourself. <laughs> and it's also a seller's market if the company wouldn't hire you if the advertisement was we're looking for a president or a general manager. If they wouldn't hire you, but they're willing to sell to you, you better have a damn good story and really be able to back it up with how you're going to go from where you are to where you are. Otherwise, you're being sold. 
What about the bubble? Well, you know, there's sort of a real estate bubble and there's definitely a bubble in, in business uh, acquisitions. <laughs> we don't want it to burst on you. Right? Keep in mind, there are a lot of businesses coming on the market or on the market because sellers are reading the newspaper and they know that interest rates, rising labor costs, rising materials, what is it? Whoops. What is this going to do? It's going to increase their costs. And what's that going to do? It's going to reduce their profit. So if you're doing a multiple on yesterday's profit and tomorrow it's cut in half or goes bye-bye because of rising interest rates or other costs of doing business, namely employees, go to my YouTube channel, Ted Leverett, YouTube. I did a whole series of podcasts on employees are the biggest risk if you want to buy a company. Hey, by the way, they're also the biggest risk if you own a company. Pretty good idea to start there if you're thinking of buying a business or selling it. Because you got you ought to have a story that helps you explain why your employees just aren't going to want a better cut of the action. Be careful, these so-called business appraisers and brokers. I mean, brokers do have to do a little bit of valuation work to get a listing, but they're not appraisers. So you got to get that right. You absolutely have to get it right or you're going to end up overpaying and you're going to rely on a so-called expert. Give you a little tip off. We don't give a shit what the appraiser says. We're looking at return on investment and cash flow. And we want to see just how badly we could try to wreck this good company and still make it survive. And if it passes our doomsday testing, who cares what the what a comp says or some appraiser says? It's a worth it's a deal worth doing. But if it can't pass that, if it cannot pass that stress testing, well, we get out of there. Yeah, it can take longer to find a business, but guess what? We don't blow our net worth and we don't get divorced and we don't have nervous breakdowns when things go wrong. So, folks. Do not ignore the labor market. Disgruntled employees are causing trouble. It's in the newspaper every day. Okay. Oh, man. Don't make yourself and everyone else crazy. Please hire advisors with a proven history of working for buyers and sellers of the kind and size of deal you intend. Not the Wall Street guys and not the people buying hair salons. Depending on the size and kind of business, that's the advice you want. Now, how do you know if they're any good? Well, ask them. Say, in fact, why don't you write it down? Say, how have you facilitated deals that should occur or did occur? If they can't tell you a story or two, don't fall for bullshit. Hire deal makers and deal closers. Guess what? Avoid buyers or advisors. Advisors. Don't. I mean, avoid advisors who don't know enough about deal making for small and mid-sized companies. This happens all the time. And you know what happens? Not wanting to make mistakes. These posers are more likely to poo-poo good deals or worse, bless lousy deals. All right, look, let me, I only have two slides. We'll go to Q&A. See that? That's called the fork in the road. See, wait a minute. I'm not done with that. That's called the fork in the road. Why is it a fork in the road? You see all that buyer competition? These are all those people out there copying and emulating one another, helping one another compete, um, then competing with one another. And they're all chasing the same kinds of deals, offering the same kinds of, uh, oh boy, marketing of themselves, et cetera. And guess what happens? They, they delight sellers and brokers. Yahoo! But the bad news is, once it comes down to actually bidding, well, the dumbest buyers can win. So what I'm hoping you'll do is take the road to the right. We're well, out there by yourself in search. There are no other buyers around you unless you take your time and that brings them in. And when you're working with brokers, hey, they will let you be first in line if they know you're going to do a deal. But if you screw around with them, they won't. They don't need you. No broker needs a particular buyer, period. That's why we go to the hidden market, too. Okay. Before we get to Q&A, how does this thing work? Got it. Stay in touch. Go to my website. Email me from the website. Get 
download that um, creative financing book. I'm trying to bring up stuff today that to cause you to think a little bit deeper, but let's not let our conversation end here. We can privately Zoom. I can help you get better results. Go to my website, partneroncall.com. Hey, I can help you with deploy. Hey, how do you think I get clients? Nobody hires me unless they read my books. And that's why they hire me. I then help them deploy the tactics. I'm Ted Leverett, the original business buyer advocate. Thanks for listening. Be careful. You want to go to Q&A? Let's do it. Can I get rid of this? I think, I, oh boy, hold on. Try not to sign myself out of this. I've never used this particular venue here, folks. So it's all alien to me. Okay, I'm right at the, let me go right to the top. Hello, Ted. Hello, Ted. La, la, la. Better stay. Need to set up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, somebody said, be sure you set up your own name to in increase uh, deliverability. Absolutely. Oh, look, at I started my closing remarks early because guess what? We got through it. Yeah, get your own domain. Uh, business plans are a guess at best. Yeah, <laughs> Paul. <laughs> That's why we focus on cash flow. Those of you who have been following me, you know how big I am on cash flow. Hey, what are you really buying when you're buying a business? You're buying cash flow, period. But where does the cash flow come from? Employees. Can you say why we're paying attention to employees? <laughs> Employating. Okay. I, oh, yeah. How do you tell the difference between a seller who's genuinely interested in selling versus just shopping around? Get them to a letter of intent. If they're giving you the green light you want to hear, slap a letter of intent on them. Right there. They First of all, they go, oh, my God, what do I do with this? So <laughs> unless they're really dumb, they're going to take it to their lawyer. And the lawyer is going to go, well, no, I don't like this whole idea because I'll be fired if you sell your business. You better. So what I like to suggest to sellers when we give them a letter of intent is, you know, it's probably not a good idea to have the lawyer that's been your company lawyer for a long time. You know, your cousin or your divorce lawyer. Probably a good idea to talk to somebody who specializes in the sale of companies, because then when they see this letter of intent, they'll know this is how things progress. Now, that lawyer wants to make money. So they're going to what? Try to see if there's a way to do a deal. Hope you're getting that. <laughs> Take them out for some beers. <laughs> All right, Paul, you're, you're cracking me up here. <laughs> what, what is the recommended budget for buy side advisors? Hey, write this one down. Okay. How much can you afford to lose? Now, anybody who's been asking that question, ask, they ask it everybody. For businesses that are, well, uh, let's see, Michael says, say in the one to four million deal size, that means price. Oh, I think you're, it depends, you know, how smart you are, how much you have somebody like me on your team who are helping you do work. So before you bring in the lawyer and the accountant or any other let's say specialist, we, we've determined just about everything we need to know. And now we only need confirmations and we need a contract. So we don't bring in, like say, lawyers and accountants too soon. You go to Monday, go bye-bye real fast. Same with quality of earnings people. Bye-bye real fast. 10,000 to about 30,000 bucks is what you ought to, ought to um, put in your hopper for everything related to accounting and that kind of due diligence, legal, et cetera. Then there are people like me, um, if you shop around, you'll find that most of the people who are actually any good are earning from buyers somewhere between two and 3% of the value of the transaction that gets done. And you say, Oh, well, that's a lot of money. Well, how much can you afford to lose? And I'll tell you what, you don't get somebody on your team. It doesn't have to be me, but it needs to be somebody like me because the lawyers and accountants will milk you to death. Why? Because they can. All right. I have a team assembled, but I can't get brokers. Well, I'll tell you why you can't get brokers, because you're not doing what we do in a winning business buyer marketing plan. So, hey, look, Melissa, go to my website. Guess what? Partneroncall.com. Find that white marketing plan. For 250 bucks, you can practice on me. Show me what you're doing. Send me whatever it is you're using. I'll charge you $250, and I'll tell you how bad it is. Or... I'll tell you how you could tweak it. Now, I won't do all the work to write it. That you're going to have to hire me to do. But at least you might as well know what the big red flags are. Remember, 
This, this whole, this crap about blaming brokers, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Brokers love me for this one. Show up with what they want. They want to know you can do a deal. You have the money. You won't screw around. You're honest. And they will jump over backwards. Remember, the faster they make the sale, the faster they earn their commission. It's all about turning inventory. Get a letter of intent. Well, that's just one of the screening techniques about letters of intent. Wait, 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 no, no, didn't, somebody's not listening. I didn't say if you don't know anything about the business. What I said was in your preliminary discussions, we call this pre-LOI due diligence. Go to YouTube. I've given you detailed instruction on exactly what pre-LOI due diligence is. You do that. Just do it. That's when you submit the LOI. So some of us are able to get through that pre-LOI due diligence with an owner. Well, if there's a broker there, we can get through it pretty fast because they've already prepared the seller, hopefully. If there's no broker, well, it just takes longer. But you have to go through those motions. Otherwise, how in the hell could you what? Submit a letter of intent. So what I'm letting you know, get this right. Don't misunderstand me and tell everybody Ted says use wallpaper for letter of intent. Move them quickly because if you keep the brokers and the sellers focused on you, they don't have time to talk to your competitors. Keep them moving along. Get the information you need. Slap them with a letter of intent. If they're not for real, they won't sign it. If they are for real, they have nothing to lose. You know, unless you're making a bozo offer, then, you know, they might tell you to go pound sand. <laughs> Bully, your client works for me. This sounds like one of my clients. That's what they say to me. Oh, my God. It's He's not. I don't think. All right. I'm about to walk out of here. It's Friday night. I got things to do. 60 more seconds. I'm gone. If there are no more questions, hey, hope you had fun. I'm having fun. 47 seconds left. Thank Nunzio for putting this show together. And, and thanks for letting me wrap it up. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, I don't know. Should we be gone? I think we are. Oh, yeah, the books. You wasn't listening. Okay. Guess what? Go to my website, partneroncall.com. It lists the books. Look, there they are on this screen. The first two are sold on Amazon. Go to Amazon. Type Ted Loveret in. How to prepare yourself and find the right business to buy, Amazon. How to buy the right business or away, Amazon. You need both, two different topics. Financing, do not do not buy my book at my website. I will not refund your money. You can get it free right now. Use BOSS UP, B-O-S-S-U-P, all caps. That's the coupon code. When you go to my website, download it. Got it? Hey, it's been a thrill. <laughs>